on the recorder, just so you know. Yeah. So no, uh, I don't know. Don't start cursing out John C. Riley on the. <laughs> I'll wait until you. <laughs> right. Finished, right. Exactly. Um, I thought it was over. That sounds like a Steve Coogan. Oh dear. Shut the door on him. Well, isn't he coming back in? Is he coming back in? With Are we doing this with Steve or just me? No, just you, I believe. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know. I thought he might be bringing. Is he bringing something back for you? Because I'm. friend it's like an actor and a filmmaker so and we were outside at the brooklyn academy of music aka bam oh yeah and he and john riley was in one of the films he just walked over and so and my friend was like oh take a picture of a you know he was very nice about it he doesn't usually like pictures so he must he must have been a good day looking very dapper he, yeah. he, he seems to really have yeah he, he's l- lost all that weight yeah, again yeah, for yeah. the role he, he does look good. he looks good <laughs> Like back in the day, maybe a De Niro would have uh, gained the weight for the role, not use prosthetics. 325 <laughs> pounds, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That's a bit of a stretch. He was about 325? Not so much all he was, yeah. When wow, he was, at, yeah. His, at his heaviest. Yeah, when he was uh, in his 50s, yeah, he was 325 pounds, yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me just get this a little closer. Yeah. Because you're soft. You may be a, maybe okay. you're soft-spoken, I don't know. Anyway, nice to meet you, John yeah, S. And you. Baird. Yeah. It's kind of a... a a pretty loose, structured, conversational yeah. podcast. So it, it's not, I'm not super marketing oriented, but we'll promote the film. Yeah. Uh, correct. And I just want to remember what, a couple of things. One is, take make sure which Friday it opens. 28th. The 28th, that's right. Okay. And also, what was the name of the uh, comedian again who uh, Stan ended up working with after Ali retired for like a minute and a half? He, ne- he, he never worked after he, he, all he retired. He, well, he threatened to, or they tried to do it. Remember in the film, towards the end, uh, he, oh, sorry, sorry. he gave uh, it. Oh, oh, with, they tried with, to match him up with another. Are you talking about within the film, or are you talking yeah. about... Yeah. Oh, right, okay. So so when Ollie was, was unwell... You yes. Mean, yeah, I thought you meant after Ollie died. No, no, no. All oh, right, I okay. Know re- I know um, you. It was uh, it was actually a made up name. We we made oh. we, yeah we made up the name. We, Is that we, right? Yeah, we, oh, we good. for some reason we weren't allowed to use the real name. So he's, he um, was a uh, based was, on a person. Yeah, based on somebody. We, what, what name did we use in the film? Oh. You know what? I can't even remember what it's. Uh, Ugh, I can't, I'm so sorry, but it was made up. This it is was, where my editing will help. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you, I don't mind if you, if you keep it in. Right. But um, but his name was Noby Cook. There we go. Oh, there no, it is. Noby Cook. But Noby, that, was a, Noby, yeah. that was a fictional name, yeah. I love watching, like, old... I like watching British... Uh, this is... Uh, see, I'm already distracted. I love watching British old uh, TV shows or yeah. talk shows, and they make references to these old British comedians. Yeah. And now, fortunately, you have the ability, or even for a long time, to look up, look up who these guys are. And mm. some of them, I recognize their faces. But it's so... And they always have these really funny names. Uh, crazy names. Yeah. Crazy names. Yeah. <laughs> but it's always... It's like... It, there's always some off the cuff reference to some like old 1950s or 60s comedian who was huge, you know. Yeah. And this well, guy kind of is based on somebody like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It? But but the the one that we actually do reference quite a lot. Oh, in, right. in the film is uh, is uh, Norman Wisdom. Norman yeah? Wisdom, who, who, who I looked up to. Yeah, yeah, Norman Wisdom was up. huge. Yeah, yeah huge in, in in the UK, and uh, he kind of based himself a bit on Stan Laurel, I think, his physical comedy. Um, 
but yeah, there's, there was so many of those old music hall style comedians who then, in the sixties and seventies, you know, progressed onto mainstream television, and and for a while, and yeah. in the sixties and seventies, these guys were, these guys were huge, you know, the guys yeah. who would have started in music hall, right. and made a transition, you know, and there's still a lot of. Um, in the UK, we're very nostalgic, you know. And, I see, and, and, I know. And loyal. Yeah. Or and maybe mo- those two things are mixed together. Yeah, I think more so than, than the US. I think in the Definitely. US, people, if you're in the moment, yeah, people love you. Yep. Um, but once your time has gone, you, they forget about you pretty quick. And I don't know where that comes from. I don't know where that comes from. One of the be- best examples is um, the guy who was in... Uh, what's his name again? The guy who was in Knight Rider. Oh, God. Oh, he's just, sure. David Hasselhoff. There's a, David Hasselhoff, yeah. right? Yeah. David Hasselhoff is huge. Is massive in the UK and in Germany, <laughs> right? Right. And and it started off as being this ironic thing, yeah, because yeah. they do art. But then he ended up being ironic about himself, and in the UK, people love that, right? And they, they did. They were, yeah, yeah. I, it, I'm, I, I can go ahead. Anyway, no, I'm yeah. just saying it's just an interesting thing that we do, and I don't know where it comes from, but we we, we love the underdog. I think mm-hmm. that's what it is. We love the underdog. Or it's just the right way to be. I mean, maybe most of the world is like that because, um, you know, when I uh, would go to the UK back in the day, I remember they would have these pop stars, you know, they would have like the, you know, the latest ones that would be huge, uh, like Oasis mm. or whatever. Mm. And, you know, I, and then you go though, and they would still be the, on the top of the charts would still be these, kind, you know, very seasoned, uh, old, yep. older, uh, you know, singers. And, and of course, you know, well, I mean, Paul McCartney is like royalty still. I mean, he I kind of is here still too. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, not yeah, a great he's, example. But. Yeah, he, no, but I, I get what you mean, though. But but no, we do. We and I, I wonder if it's something to do with, um, you know, the United States was 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 there was it was a country formed around people coming from the world, right? To fr- from all around the world trying to make really quickly make a better life for themselves, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think there's an element of that comes through the DNA where it's just like, yeah, we we we. we that, that's what we do. We move on. You right. know? We yeah. keep moving. Yeah. You know? yeah. Which is, you know, that's a good thing. I mean, I love this country and, and I spend a lot of time here, but it's just, mm-hmm. uh, just a different way, you know? Yeah. But so you call the UK, you call the England your home, even though you are obviously from Scotland. I'm from Scotland. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a, a big misconception is people think that British is English, yeah? Right. And, and British is actually English, Scottish, uh, Welsh, and Welsh. Northern, I- Northern Irish, yeah, that's British. And the UK consists of England, Scotland, Ireland, and mm-hmm. North- England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Right. So you you are. But British. I am. But I am Scottish. A, but I live in England. Right. So I, I just understand. confuse things. Is it because of your career? Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I moved. I moved from Scotland twenty two years ago. Oh wow! As soon as I graduated uh, from university, I, I moved to London because there was just that was a place to you know to to. Uh, to, and I, d- I didn't know anybody. I didn't have a way, and I hadn't got to film school. Um, and I thought, right, if I'm going to make anything of this, I'm going to have to go to London. You know. Sure. And is this your first theatrical feature? No, it's my third one. Your yeah. third one. I apologize. Yeah, my third one. It? Yeah. Um, uh, what, the other two. The other two. The first one was called Cass, uh, and it was uh, a true story about this uh, Jamaican orphan who was adopted by a white family mm-hmm. uh, in the 1950s in London, um, and uh, as, as sort of. Um, Jamaican child grown up uh, in a in a in a white society, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, who became um, a very violent individual, and, and the story is really about how he, why he became violent, and mm-hmm. then how, mm-hmm. how he redeemed himself, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, with with a real sort of fish out of water, an identity story. And the second movie was an adaptation of a of a book by Irvin Welsh. Oh sure, who, yeah, who wrote Transporting, and it was right. called Filth, and it starred James McAvoy as this uh, bipolar junkie cop. And it was like a, it's like a dark comedy, mm-hmm. and this is again, this is very, I mean, so different from Stan and Ollie, a completely different film. Yeah, it is, uh, but uh, tonally as well. Yeah, it's it, it's a biography, a biographical, I suppose, uh, on some level. It's about uh, sort of their later years, um, uh, and they've already come off of their, you know, their biggest Hollywood years, and there was apparently in their past a rift. Yeah. In their in their friendship in their and in their business relationships, so they had been apart and and we're being reintroduced to them at a point where they're they're coming out of semi retirement or retirement to do a series of uh, music hall sketch shows like mm-hmm. right but bringing up some of their old routines correct and um it's it's an interesting place to pick up there. Why did you choose that? Well, I just felt that you know we could have looked at several parts of their life but but I think it's more interesting when you 
when a when a person or a character is is, is challenged, yeah. Mm-hmm. And in this part of their life, they were challenged for many reasons. One was ill health. One was a lack of money. They didn't have any money left at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were forced into these tours. Um, and also, the, the main reason really is because their career had gone on the slide mm-hmm. after the war. They were kind of th- their comedy had sort of. You know, their, their sort of uh, kind of comedy had gone out of fashion to be replaced by things like uh, Abbott and Costello. So they they were they were trying to regain their stardom, mm-hmm. um, and so all these things meant that they were they were challenged. And you know, with challenge comes conflict, and with conflict comes drama. And mm-hmm. we just thought <coughs> far more interesting to, to do the untold story than just do a a straight you know retelling of 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 what their career was. You know. Mm-hmm. And it's really a love story. This this story. It's a love story between two friends who reunite and learn that what's really important about life isn't for the fame or the money. It's the it's the friendship, you know, and it's the love that they had between them. Um, it, and it just so happens to be about Laurel and Hardy, you know. Yeah, it's interesting. You you frame it as a or right now you're 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 framing it as a love story, which it is. Uh, and and yet that what you just said was, is sort of. It was disseminated through an, a fight, an argument mm-hmm. that they have towards the end of the story where it appears they're going to uh, fracture again, uh, or they do. Wounds mm-hmm. haven't quite been dealt with mm-hmm. uh, from the past. Mm-hmm. How did you do the uh, research? Because um, uh, how much res- how much information is out there? Uh, fortunately, it looks like the majority of their, at least certainly their, their longer work is out there, right? Still yeah, available. I mean, there's a lot of obviously YouTube. You can watch any Laurel and Hardy film. Yeah, but you know, we we so everybody knows that well who who have seen the films that they know what the films are about. But this is obviously about their off-screen personas, and a lot of it was from a book uh, that it was. It's not like a mm-hmm. not really a novel, but more of a sort of doc, documented book about their tour and, and and where they went on the tour. You know, right. So we used that as as a basis for for. What kind of sketches they were doing on tour, where they went, you know, uh, what they sort of looked like, because there's pictures of them. But then a lot of the um, a lot of this stuff that's not in the public domain we got from Stan's great granddaughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lady called Cassidy Cook mm-hmm. who was very helpful. Um, a lot, of, a lot from the Sons of the Desert, who are the fun, fan club of um, Laurel and Hardy. People who actually saw them and met them on the tour as well. We interviewed a lot of them. Um, and also some some interviews that had been done with Lucille Hardy, um, who, who's Oliver's wife, after he died, to see what what kind of person he was like. There were some phone calls that were that that, that we managed to get a hold of that that had been recorded. Where Stan was in the phone book. <laughs> yeah, he used to live. Yeah, he yes. used to live in Santa Monica, and he was right. in the phone book, and people used to phone him up. And, and, and record the conversations. Is that and, right? Yeah, and Steve Coogan, who plays Stan, would would listen to these and try and you know you know get the voice and get the what he was like as a personality. So there was many research well, tools, you know. It's again uncanny. I'm normally suspect when the when the their attention to accuracy and an impersonation is so strong in the film. And you miss usually the subtext yeah. or the you know what else is going on emotionally mm. and in the deeper in the fabric of it. Mm. But here that that wasn't compromised, you know. I mean that's why I really enjoyed it and wanted to come and talk to you because yeah. I really felt like there's some dramatic stuff here. It doesn't could have been two friends as you put before, mm. uh, you know, well, any two friends in a mm. way that have a long history together yeah. and who really love each other but have are ha- having difficulty, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. why that's why I hope it that's why I hope it crosses over in terms of people who don't know uh, Laurel and Hardy, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, that it, it it can be about it could be you know the story really should work uh, about any two friends, you know, any two friends yeah. who have worked together but they just happen to be these guys, yeah. yeah. That's how we wanted to make the film, you know. Yeah. And I think that's maybe why it doesn't come off as an impersonation. It comes off as maybe a bit more authentic uh because that's what the script was telling us to do, you know. Is it one of those things where when, when uh, Steve Coogan, I haven't even mentioned the actors, Steve Coogan, who plays Stan Laurel, and, and uh, John C. Riley plays uh, Oliver Hardy, when they come together on camera in the beginning of your shoot, and when they, or, or did you, I don't know if you had any time to do any kind of rehearsing or uh, improvisation or anything like that, but uh, I guess that's, I should put that in a question. Did you? Um 
we had three weeks. Uh, we we had to. We, I mean, for, time. for for the yeah for the rehearsal, we we had to have a big rehearsal time because all the you know all the skits. Yeah. And, and, oh right, and, of course and, it was choreographed. You know, it was, the, it was right. huge amount of choreography. Amazing. And, and also for for Steve and John to get the chemistry that that Laurel and Hardy had, you know, they had three. You know, they had to have time together. And the rehearsal period wasn't just for, you know, the technical process. It was also to to bond them together as individuals and, and as a team. Mm-hmm. Um, so we did, you know, we we did that. And usually in a film this size, you would only have a week's rehearsal. Mm-hmm. So we sacrificed some shooting days, and and, and took more rehearsal time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we would be really prepared. And I'm not a big one for for improvisation on set. You know, I will I will do a lot of if if we do improvisation, it'll all be in rehearsals, and then we'll write. You know, we'll rewrite from there mm-hmm. uh, and build it from there. So when we go into the shoot, we know exactly what we're doing. You know. Um, but yeah, we did. So we did have a big rehearsal time and, and a choreographer who helped with all the, you know, the uh, comedic movement. <clears throat> um, and if we didn't have that, I don't think the film would have would have worked as as it did. You know. No, there's some great. There, there's lots of them too, which is very very you know gratifying. <laughs> it's, yeah. You have a lot of their routines which they do. And I was thinking about uh, Oliver Hardy may have had the shortest. What do you call it? Uh, it was catchphrase. Basically. Catchphrase, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It was just. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Who else is that? Yeah, exactly. Mm, yeah, he he did. He was really sort of known for that. Yeah, and uh, and funny enough, the the other one of the other guys who who's in the film, but we, I mean, he's just a little tiny cameo appearance. Is mm-hmm. is a character called James Finlayson, mm-hmm. and James Finlayson was a Scottish guy who appeared in pretty much all of their movies. Yeah, he used to always pop up here and there and everywhere. And James Finlayson's ca- catchphrase as a character was. And that's where Homer Simpson. That's where oh, you know, yeah, that's, that, that's where the Sim- yeah. It's is very, it it's very, his, uh... it's very widely documented that that's oh. where uh, Do from Homer Simpson Do. came from. Was was I... from. So if you look at any Laurel and Hardy picture, you'll see this character pop up, James Finlayson saying Do, oh. and, and that's where it comes from. Yeah. Oh, I, that's great. That's yeah. a little bit of trivia for you yeah. if you're listening. <laughs> um, how, how did you end up casting these guys? I mean, obviously. Uh, um, they did a spectacular job. I can't. Really, I can't even think of who else would have yeah. done so great a job. Well, they, lucky, luckily enough, they were our first choices um, when we sat down to make the list. I mean, they, they have. Uh, I mean, even though John C. Riley's wearing prosthetics, mm-hmm. he does. There is a, a resemblance that's there. Uh, you know, it wasn't just makeup yeah. and prosthetics, right? No, I think, funnily enough, Steve and John are, are the same height as what Laurel and Hardy were as well. So mm-hmm. that really helps in terms of the physicality. Yeah. Steve's from the same part of the world that Stan was from. You know, Hardy was obviously an American, so right. yeah, there's little things like that. But really, we, we, you know, we put them at the top of our list because the, the, they, they did two things. They were both great physical comedians, mm-hmm. and, they're, and they're also dramatic, you know, performers as well. And, um, and they've got, both got a range, you know. So um, You're talking about Steve and John, yeah. not... Yeah, exa- yeah, exactly. Yeah, the casting process. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's why we uh, that's why we went to them. They took a bit of convincing because there was such a big responsibility in playing their heroes. Mm-hmm. Um, but thankfully, they both said yes. So we got our first choices, which doesn't always happen. I would imagine it rarely happens quite so seamlessly, right? Yeah. Um, Unless you have the ability to wait long periods for when you know schedules. Uh, well, we did. Lo- we, we did do that. Actually. <laughs> okay, we did. We, I did. Stand we, 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 <laughs> we waited for a long time uh, to get those to get these guys. Oh, we did. Okay. And I and I ended up taking uh, jobs in television, you know, to keep going. And I was lucky. Uh, actually, it really worked out well because I got a job on a, on a HBO show called Vinyl, um, yeah. which was uh, produced by. Martin Scorsese and Mick Jagger yeah. and got to know those guys, particularly Mr. Scorsese, got to know him very well and uh, have kept in touch with him. And, and last night he introduced a, a screening for us of Stan and Ollie in New York. And um, and it was like a dream come true, really, you know, because uh, so the, the, my point being that the wait became fruitful for so many reasons. I see. Know? Right. You, um, wouldn't have had, you wouldn't have had that opportunity to work exactly, for exactly. Martin and, and, and Mick. Exactly, and and that was a great thing, you know. I'll always treasure that. Yeah, and and Mr. Scorsese has become a big mentor for me, and we're we're now talking about doing another film together, and you know, it, it's it's. So you're giving him a break. That's nice of you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna give him a. I'll give him a, a leg up. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's thoughtful. And 
Again, uh, Stan and Ollie, directed by John S. Baird, will premiere theatrically in New York and, and Los Angeles. Anywhere else? At the moment that we're starting there, we'll roll it out. Exactly. Not so unusual, but okay. It'll be, let me rephrase, a Stan and Ollie directed by John S. Baird will have a theatrical uh, in New York and in L.A. Uh, Friday, December 28th. And then uh, from there, check local. Are there such things as local listings anymore? Is there? Is that a thing anymore? Just look on your so. phone for <laughs> Stan and Ollie. It's, again, I, you know, I just was not expecting the depth and the, you know, the, the dimension, I guess, uh, in terms of the, you know, I thought it was going to be uh, impressions. I kind of put it off, and then I'm like, watch, the, I guess I must have seen the trailer, and I was like, oh, this is looks really great. And it looks great, too. Who was the production designer, I suppose? The production designer was an Irish uh, chap called J.P. Kelly, uh, uh-huh. who, I mean, everybody who came on the project were, were, were fans of, 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 of Laurel and Hardy, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I think that we needed, you know, you needed that because... Um, you know the responsibility that that was 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 there to, you know to to keep these to keep this legacy going mm-hmm. um was was such that it needed an extra bit of you know involvement and that came in you know people's love of of this of of, of this duo and mm-hmm. uh, so that was one of our requirements you know when people came to talk about the film that they that, that, that they knew a bit about Laurel and Hardy and we knew that they loved them and would take it seriously yeah um Thank you very much. I appreciate it. appreciate your, Thank you. your uh, time and uh, good luck with everything. Uh, Thanks. With the film. Cheers.